on his computer. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, it's again a pleasure to reintroduce Miguel, who's going to continue his wonderful lectures on uh, the analytic functional bootstrap. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks a lot. So we're going to continue where we left off from uh, from last time. Um, I'm going to give a, a brief recap. So let me just ask before we start. So if there's any brave souls who would keep their video on, that would be uh, good for me. I would prefer to, to see some bit of live audience. Uh, okay, great. So thanks. Okay, so let's do a recap of, uh, of lecture one. So I started off with some motivation, which in summary was that CFTs are fun to study, so let's study them. Um, the main point about CFTs is that their correlation functions, they're determined by some set of some numbers, which I call the CFT data. And the CFT data are not arbitrary. They are constrained both by unitarity, um, as well as a condition, which you can think as OP associativity or locality, essentially. Um, or both symmetry, I mean, all these things are linked. And so in the simplest case, uh, these constraints lead to, to a bootstrap equation. So if I look at the correlator of four identical scalar fields at points one, two, three, four, uh, then since I can swap the positions of the fields, so this should be equal to this. And so I have these two representations of the correlator and basically equating them uh, equating these representations together with the OP leads to an equation which looks like this. So there's a sum over the quantum numbers which are getting exchanged in this four-point function. In this case, it's just the scaling dimension. Then there's some OP coefficient squared. So this is a, a positive quantity. Uh, and then there's this, uh, this function, which I call the crossing vector, uh, which I, I gave the expression last time. It's basically related to some hypergeometric functions. So this is a known function. OK, and so this equation holds uh, for any any CFT in any space time dimension, as long as you restrict it to the line, which is the line Z equals Z part, or where all the operators, they are, they lie on, on the line. Um, and I'm only imposing SL to R invariance. So it's, it's as if I'm working with D equals one CFTs, but you should keep in mind that any CFT in any space-time dimension, you can rewrite it essentially as a one D CFT, okay? In this limit where Z equals a part. So, okay, so we had this equation. So the purpose of these lectures was is to study this equation. And so the idea is that uh, we should think of this as a linear equation for these coefficients, the A delta, are the OP coefficients. Um, and uh, okay, so like this is better. Um, and, and so the, the F delta R, you think of them as vectors in some space. And so this is just some linear equation, which is expressing linear dependency amongst these vectors. Okay. Of course, the, 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 the important caveat is that these coefficients actually have to be positive. So it's it's a it's much harder to study than a linear equation. And so one strategy was since this is a linear equation is to introduce a basis, and I gave you some arguments that a nice basis should take something like this form. So I expand a general crossing vector in a basis of crossing vectors and their derivatives. Okay, so these derivatives we wanted them because we wanted uh, some positivity conditions to hold. And so these coefficients here, they have these properties, okay? These uh, duality properties, uh, which are required in order for this basic decomposition to make sense. Right? So if you take delta equals delta m, you want an identity. So you can check that thanks to these duality conditions, this is automatically satisfied. And, sa and same thing for the derivatives. Um, So now what's the idea? So we take our equation, we plug in this basis decomposition, and we demand that the coefficients of each basis element disappears, okay? Uh, we demand that this is zero by demanding that the coefficients of each basis element is zero. 
So the coefficients of each basis element, so the coefficient of this guy is this, and the coefficient of this guy is this. So we get this set of equations, okay, which should hold in order for crossing to hold. And so an equivalent point of view is that there exist functionals, linear functionals, which act on this equation. Okay. So these property, these functions, they have the property, they, they have to be linear. So they have you have to be able to swap them with these sums. And this might not be trivial to do. And so these omegas, these functionals, you can take them to be alpha and beta. Okay, so these are linear functionals, linear functionals that when they act on f delta, they give you alpha n delta and so on. Okay, so these coefficients are, are derived by constructing functionals that satisfy these duality conditions, acting with, with them here and matching terms. Okay. These functionals, the way that we constructed them is that we introduced some uh, clever ansatz that took this form. So it was, they had some two pieces, some F piece and some G piece. And then we solved for these pieces by demanding that our functionals, uh, they had these duality properties that we showed, that they have these properties. In particular, notice that the functions, they have double zeros. They have double zeros above, you know, whenever delta M, when M is larger than N. Of course, I haven't told you what these delta Ns are. Again, they could be many things, but so in the last lecture, we constructed them for the special case where the scaling dimensions, they correspond to generalized free fields, which is a special solution to crossing. So we constructed them both for bosons and for fermions. So I didn't write the fermion case. The fermion case just adds a one here, just gives you a plus one. And so we demand these duality conditions on the generalized free boson spectrum. Uh, so questions about this, other things that I should refresh, jog your memories about? Okay, then if not, let's, let's proceed. So the first question that we'll address is the question of completeness. Um, so we've, we've seen that there are, there exist sets of functionals, alpha n, beta n, which we can choose to be bosonic or fermionic. And given these functionals, you see that the crossing equation implies these sum rules, right? So you merely take these functionals, you act on this equation, and you get, you get these sum rules. So what do I mean by completeness? Completeness is, so you want, you want, we want to argue this, that these sets of functionals, they are complete, okay? How do we know that we've exhausted all possible constraints from crossing, that we have a full set? Well, basically, it means that we would like to prove the converse, okay? So not only would we like to go from this equation to these ones, we would like to show the reverse. We would like to show that if this is true for all the alpha n's and all the beta n's, then you would have uh, the crossing equation. Okay, so this is a lot harder, uh, but I'll show you how it can be done. First step in this proof is establishing this basis decomposition, because actually I I kind of uh, I was a bit too quick. Uh, I never actually proved that this equation was true. Okay, so I constructed functionals. What I've done is, if we want to be rigorous, we've constructed functionals that satisfy these equations. These equations. And when you act with these functionals on the crossing equation, you get these sum rules. This is what I've shown. I never actually needed to use this uh, basis decomposition. This was, if you go back to the last lecture, this is more kind of like a motivation, but I haven't really proven it. These sum rules, they follow directly by acting with the functions on the crossing equation. I don't need to use this. So, but now to prove completeness, we will have to show it. Okay, so strictly speaking, up to now, what we've shown is that F delta admits a decomposition of this form where I have what I had before, but then there could be some leftover, some function Rz, which would be killed by all the functionals. Okay, so basically we need to show that this, this remainder function is zero. 
So the way that this is done is that actually we will we will construct a function. We'll construct an explicit function. Okay, this p delta of z. This function we will construct it such that it's crossing symmetric, and the conformal block decomposition of this function takes this form. Okay, so if we can construct this function, and if we can show that it's crossing symmetric, then you see that crossing symmetry of this function is exactly the first one. Okay, because recall the crossing vector is just the difference of the conformal block minus the block with one minus n. So what is this function? This function is called the, the Polyakov block. Okay. And the way that we can construct it is in terms of ADS with a diagram. So for people who are familiar with ADS CFT. So concretely, these Polyakov blocks, uh, they come in two varieties. They could, they could be bosonic or fermionic. So I've omitted the labels here, B and F, but you should think that I can write this equation with a B or with an F everywhere. There are two kinds of Polyakov blocks as well. And so this Polyakov block is basically, it's just the sum of some width and exchange diagrams uh, in ADS2. This sum is manifestly crossing symmetric because you, you have to sum diagrams like this plus permutations in the crossing. Possibly there could also be some contact terms and it's possible to fix the coefficients of these contact terms. And so you can just compute this function. Okay, it's just some integrals. You take these integrals, you compute them and you look at what the function is and this function indeed admits a conformal block decomposition of this form and it's crossing symmetric. Yeah, well, Miguel, so this question. establishes that this equation is true. And Miguel, can I ask a question? Can I yes. ask a question? Yeah. So uh, you've taken the diagonal limit, so there is only one variable z. So in, in, in the language of uh, Witten exchange diagrams, is there some degeneracy between the channels? Um, no. Uh, no, there's no degeneracy. They're all. In order to have yeah, but then in order, to, order to have three channels, I require two variables in the, say, if you take the Mellon transform. So if you are taking the diagonal limit, you're down to one variable. So what, uh, I mean, aren't you imposing relations between some, uh, between the channels? Uh, well, you have to fix the relative sign of the T and U channels. So for the boson and the fermion, this will be, uh, they will have opposite signs, but the T-channel Witten diagram, the U-channel Witten diagram, if you expand them in the S-channel, mm -hmm. they will be different. Well, but maybe I can. will be different because, because basically, even in one D, you can have you have parity even and you have parity odd scalars. Yes. In the decomposition. And these guys in the T-channel Witten diagram and the U-channel Witten diagram, they will come with opposite signs. Right. So they, they are different. Yeah. So in, in the language of, uh, say, the Mellon variables or in terms of the Mellon variables, the diagonal limit corresponds to doing what in terms of S and T? In terms of S and T? Well, it's, well, I don't know. In terms of if it was an S matrix, this yeah. limit would correspond to setting the U equals zero. Okay. But you can set U equals zero or T equals zero. There are two ways. So you can look at the forward limit or the backwards limit. So here, uh, well, I think it would be u equals zero. Hmm. Um, but yeah, there are still three three different diagrams that you can write down. They are different. Hmm. Okay. So okay. this discrete swap of fields leads to this swapping the signs of some of the terms in the conformal block decomposition. Hmm. Okay. So, okay, so basically, so you compute these diagrams and it's possible to choose this coefficient in a clever way, such that when I do the conformal block decomposition of this Polyakov block, I will get precisely these functional actions, which I know, right? I have functional, so I can just, I can just plot these. And so I can choose these coefficients such that they match this. Uh, and hence, I have proven this equation. So at this point, I have to make a very important remark because people tend to, be, to get confused here. 
So even though I'm talking about ADS-CFT and Witten exchange diagrams, and so Witten exchange diagrams, they appear in perturbation theory in ADS-CFT. So this might lead you to think, ah, we're doing perturbation theory here. We're looking only at free theory. So no, you should not think about this. This is a mathematical identity, okay? So you can just plug this into the computer and you can check that this is true. Now, we derived it by computing these, uh, these diagrams, but it doesn't matter. This is, at the end, this is just some function which has the right properties. So we don't need to think about holography. So if, no one, if ADS-CFT had not been discovered yet, in principle, you could have found this function anyway, and you could have shown that it's led to this equation. Okay, so this has nothing to do with perturbation theory. I mean, there is a link, of course. There is a reason why these have to match, but um, but we are not doing perturbation theory here. We're not doing holography. All of this is just completely general. This is just a mathematical statement. Okay, so this is how you prove this identity. Now, the second step in our proof of completeness. Uh, what are we going to do? So we're going to start off with the crossing equation. Okay. And we're going to plug in this, this basis decomposition. Okay. For every term, we're going to plug in the basis decomposition that we, that we just proved. Now, if we can swap these two series, if we could swap them, then you see that this would become this. And indeed, now, if you impose that each of these guys is zero, then the full thing will be zero. That is, if you prove, if you show that, if you would show that demanding that the sum rules vanish for all the functionals alpha n and beta n, it would prove that the crossing equation holds. Okay, which is what we want to show. Uh, however, there's a catch, right? Because uh, we had to swap these series, and it's not at all obvious that you are allowed to do this. In fact, in fact, that's the whole point. That's the whole point is that when can you swap these series? Um, so, in any case, what we have shown then is that we, if we can argue that satisfying these sum rules implies that this swapping condition holds, that we can swap the series. Okay, if we can show that this implies this, then we are done. Because we can come here, we can swap the series, and then we get zero. So really, this is the crux of the matter, is, is proving, proving that this implies this. And I'm not going to do it in, in full detail. It's a bit of a technical argument. But you can see that, I mean, so these are two infinite series. So how, how do you prove that they commute? Basically, you have to study the tails of the series, and you have to argue that they are sufficiently suppressed. This is where the danger comes from, is from the, the tails of, this, of the series. And so we have to study things like large n limits of functional actions and large scaling dimension uh, limits of functional actions and limits where you take both of them big at the same time. Uh, so these, these we can study or, uh, independently, right? Because these are just some functions that we can compute once and for all. If we have the functional kernels, we can just compute this, uh, or we can extract them from these Witten exchange diagrams. So all these things can be studied. Uh, and then it will depend on the large scaling dimension limit of the OPE density. So this is the crucial part. So all Sorry. This, this is kinematics, but this is dynamics. Yes, Nico. Yeah. Uh, so when you take both n and delta large, what's the relation between n and delta? Is the ratio fixed or what? Yes, fixed. OK, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the relevant limit is where they're, they're at the same order. So clearly, the, the important thing is, is, is this. And so this is crucial for establishing the, the, that these sums commute, right? Because this is one of the ingredients that comes in here. It's a del. Um, and so what, what we need to do is we need to set a bound. We need to know a bound on this OP density. We have to demand that it doesn't grow too fast. If it grows too fast, then we would not be able to commute these series. Or rather, what we should do is we need to show 
that the vanishing of the sum rules implies a bound on this OP density. Okay? This is the logic of our argument. We are trying to show that this implies this. So we need to actually show, show that this implies a bound on this, and this bound is sufficient to ensure that these sums commute. Um, and so we'll, we will see we will see that indeed these bounds follow as a consequence of the functional sum rules. And, and then there's some technical arguments, uh, which I will not explain here, that proves that you can commute these sums. Okay. So what's the just upshot? To, one, one second, Miguel. So just to clarify the logic. So if I have A delta, which violated this uh, bound that you're going to derive from here, I, uh, so you're not saying you're not saying that those are ruled out. You're just saying that uh, using uh, this basis, you can explain only those theories which satisfy these bounds. I'm saying I'm saying that no, but I'm saying that solutions to the crossing equation have to satisfy these bounds anyway. So you but cannot have I mean, a solution, you cannot have a solution that does not satisfy this bound. But how does that logically follow from the chain of arguments that you gave? I, I thought the swapping is a condition that you're checking. So how can that? Tell you that uh, these conformal field theories are ruled out. So we are we are trying to now what we're trying to prove is that these sum rules holding imply the crossing equation, right? That's what we want to show. Yes. So we know that this implies this. Yeah. And now we want to go the opposite way. Yeah. yeah. This chain of argument I follow, but then. Uh... I don't understand how that implies that you're, uh, you wouldn't uh, have any CFPs where A delta grows faster than whatever you're going to say. Well, I mean, it's easy, it's easy to see. So if you have a CFT that it satisfies crossing, so then it has to satisfy these sum rules. So you can just look at the implication in the reverse order if you want. So for sure, these A deltas, they will have to satisfy the bounds that follow from this. Uh, That's for sure. But, but swappability is, why should that be a, uh, a necessary condition? Swappability is a condition that you're demanding. Sorry, probability, what? Swappability, so the swapping condition, the swapping condition that gives rise to these bounds on A delta. That's a condition that you're demanding. Why is that a condition that is expected? Well, I, no, I mean, if it was not expected, it would mean that these sum rules are not sufficient for establishing crossing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I agree with that. Yes, but then that I, claim they are sufficient. I claim they are sufficient because these sum rules imply a bound on the OP density, which guarantees that this swapping condition is holds. And once this swapping condition holds, you can prove crossing from this equation. Uh, sorry, I, I have two questions. So, every, so, so if you want, you can, you can think of it like this. Every solution to crossing satisfies the sum rules and every solution to the sum rule satisfies crossing. So I think you're worried. You're worried that uh, since we're going from the sum rules to the yes. to the to the towards the crossing equation, you would worry that you'd miss something, some yes. solutions. Not all yes, of them yes. would have this yeah, property. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, this is an yeah, equivalence. Right. This is an equivalence. So you have to prove so it. it. You've already proven it the other way around. So that that okay? Yeah. Okay. I, I, let me just think about it. Uh, Okay. I think there are more questions. Yes. So one question is first, uh, in principle, you have to prove that the functional already commutes with the sum because otherwise you don't even have some rules, right? This we've already shown. So this we've already shown. We've proven that the functional, the action of the functional on an infinite sum of uh, crossing vectors, it commutes with that infinite sum. This should that depend on a delta? Very important. Sorry? Shouldn't that depend on a delta also? And uh, it, it turns out it doesn't. What it that does depend is on the Reggie behavior of a CFD correlator. Okay. And the other thing, uh, it's not clear to me what, why did you introduce the, uh, the Polyakov block before? What did you use it for? Well, we'll see what's, what, I was, we'll see shortly what's the point, but ah. up to now, the only reason for introducing it is just, it's a way of proving this equation. But, uh, how did it enter the proof? Okay, so proof? there exists a function there we've 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 shown well, we've shown. So if you if you compute these diagrams, yeah, 
and you do the conformal block expansion, you will find a function that looks like this with some coefficients here, cn of delta and dn of delta. And if you choose this contact term in the correct way, these coefficients will precisely match these functional actions. Okay? And so now you have a function. You, you can just, I mean, you don't need to expand it in conformal blocks. You can just stare at the function and you can see that it's crossing symmetry. And so th th these two statements imply this one, which is what I wanted to prove. Uh, sorry, it's not clear to me. We constructed a function, and so what? We've constructed a function, p delta of z, which has this conformal block expansion. Yes. And which is crossing symmetric. OK. OK? I mean, I have not shown it to you, but if you take these, if you take these diagrams, mm -hmm. these diagrams in ADS CFT, so these are just some integrals, and they produce some function. OK. OK? They give you some function of the cross ratio, z. Now, you take that function, it's crossing symmetric by construction. And now you take that function and you expand it in conformal blocks. And when you do, you will find that the conformal block decomposition looks like this. It's just, uh, it's, what come, it's what comes out. There could be other okay. stuff. Indeed, so if you don't take precisely the right combinations of diagrams, so if you had only taken the S channel with a diagram, for instance, well, you would break crossing symmetry in that case, but also this expansion would not be correct. You would get something else. Yeah. But if you take it in the right way, with the right choice of contact terms, you will get precisely this. OK. So I'm not sure, Edge, is it that you don't see how you go from these two to this one? I mean, this, this is just a, some function that we define, but then f delta is a generic function for some CFT that we don't know. No, I think I, think I understand. No, 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 no because you're not. So okay. f delta, yeah. F delta yeah, is, it's yeah. f delta is g delta of z minus g delta of one minus z. That's all that it is. Okay, okay. It's the difference between the conformal block in the S channel and the conformal block in the T channel. Okay. Right, we are looking at the crossing equation. The crossing equation is, is this, it just establishes that the OP decomposition in the S channel is equal to the OP decomposition in the T channel. I see. Okay. So yeah, I, it's hard for me to write because I'm using a mouse, but uh, if you go back to the first lecture, you'll see that uh, yeah, I see. the definition of this, okay? But yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, yeah, so this is fixed by conformal symmetry. So, okay. So indeed, okay, so up to this point, so we still need to prove this bound on the OP density. But if that is true, you have to believe me, there's some technical arguments that proves this. This is the upshot. The upshot is that the content of the crossing equation is completely equivalent. So now we've shown in both, say, both senses to the vanishing of the sum rules. And we can choose these sum rules to be either the bosonic ones or the fermionic ones. OK? So any solution to this equation, again, we are using these bosonic and fermionic bases, which which have something to do with free theory, but it doesn't matter. At the end, these are just some functions. They are just some mathematical functions that you can compute once and for all. And the claim is that solutions to this equation are the same as the solutions to these equations, which are the same as the solution to these equations. Okay? So it's a complete reformulation of the constraints of crossing symmetry. Questions about this? So this contact term thing you have not addressed as yet. I mean, you said that uh, for a suitable choice of contact terms, uh, you will get these alpha and and beta. N, but what is the suitability criteria? Is this something that you're going to tell us? Well, there's a simple there's a simple uh, choice that leads to the correct results. So, so for, uh, so first of all, the only contact terms that you that you can add are contact terms which are Reggie bounded. They have to be Reggie bounded because these functionals, they can only act on Reggie bounded correlators. So, you know, 
uh, this equation must come out of the crossing equation for a Reggie bounded function. Otherwise, these coefficients could never be functional actions. They would be something else. So, the so for the fermion, there's actually nothing that you can add. So there's there's just you just compute these with an exchange diagrams and you're done. For the boson, there is exactly one diagram that you can add, which is lambda pi fourth. It comes from uh, pi fourth interaction, and this coefficient is fixed by the fact that the bosonic basis does not have beta zero. So beta zero is zero for the bosonic basis. Yeah. And so you have to choose so the, the contact term in order to cancel the first term in this conformal block decomposition. So the first term here, in the case of the boson, is zero. That's enough to fix this coefficient. So, so the full correlator, not the block, the full correlator was rigid bounded. And then you're saying that the basis also should be rigid bounded. But this seems to be a sort of a sufficient condition, not necessarily a necessary condition. Yeah, you could, I guess you could come up with some other bases, but the, uh, so the point is that you want the basis elements to be bootstrappable by the function, by the basis of functions that we constructed, right? Because we want to, we want to derive this equation. This equation, I'm see, there are functionals here, right? So these functionals, they have to be, uh, the functions, they're the ones that we've come up with, which act on Reggie bounded functions. So this guy has to be Reggie bounded. So if this guy was not Reggie bounded, if it diverts as some power of Z, then the statement would be that there is still an equation of this form, obviously, with some coefficients. And those coefficients now, they would be computed by a different set of functionals. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I discussed this at the end of the last lecture. And mm -hmm. so those functionals, they would form a basis for all correlators which diverge in the Reggie limit with some power. Okay, so you could go through the same thing. You could prove all these things. It's just that you would get less functionals at the end of the day, and the space that you would bootstrap would be larger. So you could prove you could prove a theorem. Basically, you could show that uh, a similar theorem to this, but now where you are considering uh, correlators which are which diverge as some power of set then the basis of functions would be different and the set of allowed functions here would also be different. But here we are interested in, in CFT correlators which are Reggie bounded. And we've proved that they are Reggie bounded. Well, okay, I, ga I gave an argument. So is the logic uh, clear or not? Uh, yeah, I guess so. So I think the thing that I'm missing is that you, you made a statement that you also want the blocks to be bootstrappable. So I didn't understand what, what that meant. So that seemed to be I mean, important. The blocks, yeah. boot, the blocks to be bootstrappable. So is that you, you come up with some function P delta of Z, which has an, an expansion of this form with some coefficients. And you want to be able to compute these coefficients from the functionals. So any Polyakov block that you write down, it will satisfy an equation of this form with some coefficients here, mm -hmm. right? So now what we want is we want to act with functionals on this equation to determine what those coefficients are. But you see, there's an infinite sum here. So right, right, right. I, can, I have cool. to come up with functionals on which I can swap with this sum. And swapping with the sum will depend on the Reggie behavior of this function. Okay. Right. I mean, if these coefficients, if, if these coefficients are just some random functions, if they are not related to the functionals, then, uh, you know, it would not work. I could not prove this completeness property, right? It's crucial to derive this equation with the functional actions here. Otherwise, it will not work. Right. So this is a technical level of determining alpha and delta through this uh, uh, Wheaton diagram argument. I mean... Uh... This, so, this, uh, it's, it's, so I said that it is a sufficient condition. I'm, I'm not being able to still quite understand why it is, an, it is a necessary condition. So sufficiency, I'm happy with. The necessity, I'm not sure. So I guess you're worried that these coefficients might not be the functionals? Uh, is, that, is that what yes, you're worried I'm, about? I'm just, yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm just worried that uh, it is possible to expand uh, 
something that is rigid bounded in terms of blocks that are not rigid bounded uh, such that ultimately uh, i mean it still works but uh, you don't have the basis elements don't need to be rigid bounded so uh, i mean again i'm not saying this any statements about that i'm just saying if that's the case then the basis elements they cannot be bootstrapped with the same functionals because I, so if you write yeah. down the crossing equation okay. for those. So is, is, yeah, so is the following statement that I'm about to make correct? So by, by that, you mean that you will not be able to calculate alpha n and beta n using your uh, functionals. Yes. Yes. OK, fine. OK, thank you. Or you could not use the same basis to compute all these blocks. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, Okay, so basically we've com we've proved completeness. So studying the so basically what we've shown is that studying the crossing equation is the same thing as studying these sum rules. And the point is that it's much easier to understand the consequences of these sum rules than to understand the consequences of the crossing equation. So that's the logic. Now let me mention the the Polyakov bootstrap. Um, I will I will talk more about this uh, later. But so what is the statement of the Polyakov bootstrap? The Polyakov bootstrap states that if you have a CFT correlator, which admits a conformal block decomposition of this form, then it also admits a decomposition with the same OP coefficients, but where you replace the conformal blocks by this function that I defined before called the Polyakov block. Okay, so the Polyakov block, recall, it's equal to this guy here. But then there's some extra stuff. OK? So wh what is the point of this, uh, of this expansion? The point is that this expansion is not manifestly crossing symmetric, because the conformal block is not crossing symmetric by itself. But the Polyakov blocks are. OK? So when you write the correlator like this, you have an expansion which is manifestly crossing symmetric. Uh, however, what you lose is the OP. So the OP is not correct because you see here the conformal blocks are these ones, whereas here on the right, so you'll get the same conformal blocks that were here, but then there's these extra terms. And so these extra terms will have to cancel out in the full sum. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's easy to see that the fact that they cancel out in the full sum is equivalent to this swapping condition that we proved that well that's that I argued is true that there are two sums that you can commute. So if indeed let us prove that the Polyakov so demanding this so think of this as a constraint. You demand you you say that any solution to crossing has to satisfy this. So let us prove that this statement is actually equivalent to the crossing equation. Well so the implication in one sense is trivial. So if the Polyakov bootstrap is true, then G admits a representation of this form. And since each term is crossing symmetric, then the corollary is crossing symmetric. OK? So the implication in one sense is trivial. Now we need to prove the other, the reverse. We need to, improve, to prove that crossing of the correlator implies that this is true. So, but how can you prove that this is true? Well. If the correlator is crossing symmetric, it satisfies the crossing equation. And hence, I can apply functionals to it, which lead to these sum rules. OK? But we've already seen that these sum rules imply the swapping, this swapping property that these two series commute. And it's very easy to see that if the two series commute, then indeed the sum over Polyakov blocks is the same as the sum of conformal blocks. Essentially, because you see, here's the, here you have a sum over delta. And here you have a sum over n. And so if you swap the series, you're going to get the sum over delta of alpha n delta, which is supposed to be 0. OK? And so all these this extra terms will be coupled because these sum rules are true. OK? So basically, we've reformulated the crossing equation in yet another way. We've proven that. The crossing equation is completely equivalent to demanding that CFT correlators have a representation of this form, where this Polyakov block is precisely the Polyakov block that I defined before. So uh, 
I told you that in this lecture, I'm, I'm not putting uh, any references, but so this, this idea of writing this expansion, it goes back to an old paper by, by Polakov, but really the people who, who revived and understood this idea properly were uh, Aninda, uh, uh, Gopakumar, and uh, a bunch of co collaborators. So I don't know if they'll call it Sen, Koshik Gosh, Abrakin Kaviraj, and I'm sure that I'm forgetting uh, uh, a few others. But so they revived this, they, they noticed the connection with the Witten exchange diagrams. And so the, the difference here from their work is that uh, in their work, it was a bit, it was not clear since they didn't have this language of functionals. Uh, it was not clear how to fix this this contact term uh, ambiguity. In many cases, this ambiguity turns out that it doesn't matter. But so the functions completely fix it here in this particular case of these D equals one CFTs. Um, and the Polakov bootstrap is useful for other reasons that we'll discuss uh, later. So, um, okay, so now we've proven the equivalence of the crossing equation to the vanishing of these sum rules. And the vanishing of these sum rules, you see that they depend on it. The sum rules, they're associated with bases of functionals. And I've constructed two. I've constructed one associated to the generalized free boson, another to the generalized free fermion. But actually, in principle, there should be many other bases. It's just that these are the ones that we construct. Uh, these are particularly good ones because, first of all, we can construct them. Uh, then they, they have these nice positivity properties that follow from the duality conditions. Um, and, uh, and so this, this will translate into bounds. And these bounds, they will, be, they will be optimal. Why are they optimal? They are optimal because they will be saturated by the solutions which are dual to these functionals, namely by generalized free fields. So this is the logic. You want to construct bases associated with, with solutions. Because this way, the bounds that you get, they have a chance of being optimal because they will be saturated by that solution. OK? Uh, so as I said, other interesting bases exist, dual to interacting the solutions uh, to crossing, but they are harder to construct analytically. But we'll see later how we can get a handle on these other bases. OK, so let us study some these bounds then. Um, let us study these bounds in some simple cases. So let us look, for instance, at the beta 0 f function. So this is the fermionic functional. So if you plot it, it turns out that it looks a bit like this. So it depends on delta phi, but roughly it looks like this. So the, 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 the scaling dimensions for the GFF uh, generalized free fermion take this form. And the duality conditions on this functional if you go back, they tell you that it should have a first order zero at delta zero f, and then it has to have double zeros at all the other ones. And so once you plot it, you see indeed that it has these double zeros. It turns out that it's always positive here. Then it has a first order zero here. Then there's a negative region, and then it goes back to being zero at here. OK, so now let us look at the sum rule associated with this functional. It tells us that when we sum the OP density convolved with this functional action, it has to give zero. And since these coefficients are positive, it must be that the positive contributions from the OP in this positive regions cancel the contributions in the negative region. And so this immediately implies that for any CFT, we must have at least one primary whose scaling dimension lies in this negative region. So this delta star is some number, you know, you have to compute it for, as it depends on delta phi on the external dimension. Okay, it doesn't matter, it's just some number that you can compute. It doesn't have a nice form. Um, it has to lie between this delta star and delta zero f. Okay, so this, it follows immediately from this, from this functional. And in particular, this implies that there is a universal upper bound on the gap of the CFT. Recall that delta gap is the dimension of the first operator in the OPE, which is not the identity. Okay? It tells you, you know, it's not possible to have no operators all the way up to uh, whatever, delta one or. So it's impossible because then you just have positive contributions. So this equation could never be satisfied. 
So you necessarily need that there has to be at least one operator here. One operator. And this bound is optimal. It's optimal because it's saturated by the generalized free fermion. So delta gap has to be at most delta zero f. And you cannot improve this because the generalized free fermion has an operator only there, right? This is the spectrum of generalized free fermion. So in other words, you can draw you can draw a plot which gives you constraint on the CFT data. So this is the external dimension, delta phi. This is the, the gap of the CFT. And this is telling you that any solution, any CFT delta gap has to be below here in this region. So then this line is one plus two delta phi. And this cannot be improved. Okay, this is an optimal bound which is saturated by the generalized free fermion. So this is an optimal bound in d equals one. But actually, so this logic of, of finding bounds on the gap is actually the first application of conformal bootstrap methods. And it was done in, in higher dimensions. And at some point, so maybe many of you have seen, there's this famous plot uh, where you, you, you set a bound on the gap in three DCFTs. And if you do this plot as a function of delta phi, then you know the plot is a lot more interesting. So there's some, a region that looks like this, and then there's another that looks like this, and there's some kink here. And it turns out that this kink, if you look at delta phi and delta gap at the kink, then these match the, the dimensions of the 3D easing model. In other words, in this case, at this particular point, the theory which saturates this bound is an interacting theory, which is the 3D easing uh, at the critical point. So here with our methods, we found something a lot more boring, but this is still a valid bound. So as I told you for any, C this is true not only for 1D CFTs, it's true for any CFT. Uh, and so uh, there should be a bound on delta gap, which is equal to one plus two delta phi. And indeed you see that the, the better 3D bound lies below this one as it should be, but it's still a valid bound, okay? So this is to make the link to the usual story. But now we can we can we can keep playing with these functionals. Um, so let us look at other simple examples. So now instead of taking beta zero, let's look at beta one minus beta zero. So when you plot beta one minus beta zero, then it's very it's kind of interesting. So it looks a bit like this. Okay. And essentially, you could have drawn this picture if you know the duality properties of beta 1 and beta 0. So they have to have double zeros for delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, and so on. So in principle, they are positive here. And then at delta 1, this guy has a double zero, but this guy has a first order zero, and vice versa here. And so it, sh it should have a shape that looks kind of like this, and indeed it does. So now this is super interesting, right? Because the same logic holds. So the sum rule, there is a sum rule associated with this functional, which looks like this. And again, the positive contributions have to cancel the negative ones. So in particular, if in your CFT, there's a gap which is above this delta star. So let's ignore this delta star. Let's say that our spectrum starts off somewhere here. Then demanding that the positive contributions cancel the negative ones tells us that necessarily there has to be an operator that lies inside this bin the bin comprised between delta zero f and delta one f, okay? So this is very interesting, right? Because we started with this uh, crossing equation, which is a continuous equation, right? For, for continuous variables. And now we are getting some discreteness out of it. It tells us that in this finite size bin of size two, so these, these values are, they are computed by this. So this has length two in scaling dimension space. There has to be an operator inside that bin. Okay, so I find this, this is pretty cool. Uh, and the, uh, okay, so now this question. Yes. The fact that you're drawing these smooth graphs as a function of delta, is that expected or is that a feature? Smooth, what do you mean smooth? And why, why can't you have discontinuities uh, as a function of delta? Uh, that the functional actions are continuous. Yes. Um, well, I don't know, that's a good question. Uh, the crossing vectors are continuous functions. The, the functional kernels are also continuous functions. So uh, yeah, I think continu continuity in delta probably just falls from continuity of the crossing vectors. 
you might have worried that there will be some divergences on things like this. Yes. But this, by construction, there cannot be because our functional kernels were constructed in such a way that they had to be finite for any delta. This was part of the construction. When we constructed the F and G kernels, there were boundary conditions on F and G, which we imposed to guarantee that these functional actions were finite mm -hmm. for, for positive, for non-negative delta. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay? And so, okay, so here I showed you beta one minus, minus beta zero, but it's obvious that basically this generalizes. Well, it's obvious. I mean, it, it generalizes where basically you can just shift this negative size bin further up. And so you come to the conclusion that there has to be at least one operator per bin between delta nf and delta n plus one n. So again, I find this very interesting. So it tells us that in solutions to crossing, uh you cannot make operators very spread apart okay if you try to to, to put them very far away from each other it, it will not be possible it, you, you, you cannot get a solution to crossing all solutions to crossing they the operators basically they can the most they can be far apart is basically two okay and this is this is quite striking questions about this uh, sorry, here you made an assumption about the gap. Is there also some way to try and prove this assumption? No, this you cannot prove. There are solutions. There are there exist solutions which have uh, operators below this uh, this delta star. I see. I see. Well, you cannot get around that. So if if the, if you have operators here, well, you basically you meet you you will get uh, some weaker constraints. I mean, you would have to know what exactly your solution is in order to say to say what's going on. But we'll make some stronger, some more useful statements maybe uh, in a bit. But this delta star is some order one number. So. Uh, um, okay, thank you. And Miguel, this uh, how big the magnitude of beta gets that uh, can also be bounded or is that something that we can understand? Yeah, we can we can study exactly the, the behavior of these things asymptotically. Um, but I don't think I wrote it down um, in these lectures. So basically the function, mm -hmm. these, these functionals, they behave like, uh, so at, at large delta, uh, and, and I, I can't even write them down, um, well, I we'll we'll see it. We'll see. We'll see in a bit. I think I can say something. No. So imagine that I give you delta one f and delta two f. Can I say how big beta can get? Beta beta can get between these two values. What is the maximum value that beta can take between these two deltas? Can we answer questions like that? Uh, yes. Yeah. So so basically, these functional actions they are very simple. So so there's some sine squared factor, which is giving you these oscillations. And then if you remove the sine squared oscillations, then it looks like one divided by the GFF OP density times some power of delta. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it grows exponentially. Okay, fast. You can bound OP coefficient. So is that how you would you would bound OP? Yeah, this is how we'll bound it. This is how the GFF OP density will appear. It will appear, it will come out of the functional action. We'll, we'll see these bounds in a minute. So, so now let us look at OPE bounds. Let us see how we can get bounds on OPE coefficients. So for instance, now let us look at alpha zero, okay? If we plot alpha zero, now it looks like this. So notice that the betas, they are zero on the identity, but the alphas are not. Indeed, on the identity, they, they compute the, the GFF OPE coefficients. So if you plot it, it looks like this. So alpha zero f, the duality conditions tells us that it has to have double zeros at all these deltas, delta one, delta two, and so on. And then on delta zero f, it has to have a maximum where it's equal to one. These were the duality conditions on the function. So if you plot it, it looks like this. And again, the same thing is true. So the sum over all states has to vanish. So let us split this sum in the following way. So let us assume that the gap is larger than this delta star. Okay, so let us assume that the spectrum starts off somewhere here. Then what happens to this sum rule? Well, there's one contribution from the identity, which is always there. 
Then there's the contribution of some bin centered around delta zero f. So you can pick this bin uh, any way that you want. You can you can make it very small. You can make it very large as long as it can be going to this negative region. So it's up to you the size of this bin. And the rest of the contributions they are all positive, right? Because they are th they are things which lie in the, this green green region. Okay. And so, since this is positive, you find that the sum over the states inside this bin has to be smaller or equal than minus the value of the functional on the identity. And this, you know what it is. This is precisely the OP coefficient which appears in the generalized free fermion solution. Again, because these functionals, they are dual to the generalized free fermion solution. This is why this is true. Okay, so you see that the OP coefficients here, the sum of the OP coefficients here in this bin is bounded from above by the value of the GFF OP coefficient, which is just some number. So, so for instance, what these functionals, they give you bounds. It, what it is telling you is that these, these functions, they give you bounds on OP coefficients. So for instance, let's consider the problem. Let us ask, what is the maximum value of the OP density at dimension delta 0f? Let us choose, choose it to be delta 0f, which is 1 plus 2 delta 5, such that crossing holds. Okay, and we put the gap larger than this. So, so we are asking, in the space of all solutions to crossing, what is the solution which maximizes the value of the OP density at delta 0f? We are asking, well, what is the, what what is the maximum value? So in this case, it's easy to see from the previous equation that this functional tells you that the OP coefficient at that point has to be smaller or equal than the free value, the value for the generalized free fermion. So it it gives you this upper bound. So you just take this this bin, you know. So it contains at least this state. So so this has to be smaller or equal than this. But this bound is optimal, right? Because we know of a solution satisfying this equation for which the OP coefficient is this one, which is the generalized free fermion. So we conclude that this functional is what's called an OP maximization functional. It's the optimal functional for the bound on this OP coefficient. And it's optimal because it's saturated by this solution to Grossman. So again, we have this logic. We have functions which are dual to special solutions. These special solutions saturate bounds, bounds which are implied by the function. So there's some circle of ideas that, uh, that comes out. So this also generalizes. So instead of considering alpha 0, now let's consider alpha n. It's essentially alpha n. It turns out that you need to do a small shift. You need to subtract some beta n, but okay, this is like a technicality. So if you work with this modified definition of alpha n, which I call alpha tilde, and you plot it, then basically it looks as before. So there's a negative region here up to some delta star, and then uh, you know it's positive everywhere with double zeros, except at delta n, where it's equal to one. So again, we can define a bin. Uh, and so what, what, ah, sorry, here I'm going to do a bit better. So. The same logic tells us that the contributions of OPE coefficients inside this bin is bounded from above by the contributions in the negative region. So the contributions in the negative region is everything here. And now the point is that even if you don't know what goes on in this negative region, you can prove that when n goes to infinity, so when you take this delta n to be very large, the dominant contribution is in this sum comes from the identity. Much better express than me. Um, Sorry? So, so the dominant contribution when, when you take this delta n very large comes from the identity. OK? And at the same time, when n is large and delta is large, there are some simplifications. And then you get the following bounds. It tells us that when you take n to infinity, the sum overstates inside this bin of what? So you see, there's this ratio. This is the OP density of your solution. 
divided by the GFF OP density times some simple kernel. You see, so this is just sine squared. So basically, it describes the shape of this curve here. This is bounded by one. Okay, so recall that this OP density is just some gamma functions. Okay, it's the free GFF OP density. It looks like this, it's exponentially suppressed, there's this delta, okay? And so finally, this is the precise sense in which all solutions to the bootstrap equation, they are similar to generalized free fields because asymptotically, so at large delta, their OP density has to be essentially the same as the GFF density. Okay, so this is an order one kernel. So this is all, always order one. Again, it's just this, it's just this shape. And this has to be bounded by one. Questions about this bound? Yeah, so uh, in higher dimensions, is, 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 does it automatically follow that even for higher dimensions, uh, the fastest that uh, the OP density, uh, the, the OP coefficients can grow is uh, what is governed governed by generalized free fields? Absolutely, it's the same. So if you take if you take a CFT in higher dimensions and you decompose it into SL two R primaries, yes, and you look at the OP coefficients in a bin and you sum them up, it has to satisfy this bound. You can check this. Take I don't know, take the two D easing model for instance, where you have yeah. everything is known exactly. You can check that all the bounds that I've discussed so far are true. There is okay. one operator is, is for size some, two. Yeah, the OP coefficients are bounded from above in this way. So everything uh, holds. And, and this is a stronger statement. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that I understand. So the, this uh, this is uh, this seems like the way that you have presented or the, the equations that you've showed it, it seems like the statements you are making are in, in some distributional sense. So uh, does it also rule out, uh, say, a single operator who's OP is much bigger than the corresponding uh, free field, uh, generalized free field operator, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that, that, that can be true indeed. So you see here you have, to, you have to sum over the bin, but you can make the bin as small as you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is a stronger statement than the one that you're saying. In fact, this yes, bin, okay. you can make it parametrically large if you want, and this will still be true. Right, and this bin was uh, something that was below two uh, zeros, or it could be as uh, it could also uh, be as big and overlap between zeros. Yeah, it can it can go across zeros. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, as long as this bin does not scale with n, the bound will will take this form. If you take a bin whose size scales with n, then the kernel the the shape of the kernel will get modified. But there will still be a bound. I mean, the exact rigorous bound is this one. This is always true. Mm -hmm. It's just if you want to get a, a nice looking expression, you have to take this limit. But yeah, the bin here, yeah, it's it's a bin whose size does not scale with n, but it can be a 10, 20, whatever. Okay. Okay. This is always true. Okay. Yeah, so it's much, I mean, a bound on an individual OP coefficient is not very useful, right? Because there yes, could be yes, an operator yes, yes, exactly. arbitrarily close to it. Yes. So it would be meaningless. Yes. So you really need bounds on, indeed, on distributions, as you say, on integrated OP densities. Yes, okay. Thank you. So this is a very nice bound. And now it turns out that you can do the reverse. You can get a lower bound as well. Again, just by playing with these functions. So now we're going to do a function that I call the bin functional. So it look, I, I call it u n because this looks like a, a cup. So this cup, this cup functional. So I define it essentially like this. So it's beta n plus one minus beta n minus one minus alpha to the n. So if you plot it, it will look like this. It will be positive, positive, positive. And then around delta n, there's this cup region. Okay, it has a first order zero here because of this guy. It has a first order zero here because of this guy. And then it's equal to minus one here because of this guy. So it looks like this. So again, the contributions in this negative region have to cancel the positive ones. And we can bound the positive one. We know that in the positive ones, there is at least the identity contribution, which we know, right? Every CFT has a, we know the contribution of the identity. 
And so playing the same game, you can prove, so now the size of the bin is fixed. This you cannot change, but it shows that inside the bin of size, well, inside this bin, again, the ratio of the OPE density to the free density times some simple kernel, which is basically some, uh, it look, it, it's similar to this one, now has to be larger than one. Okay? So not only there's an upper bound on the OP coefficients, but there is also a lower bound. So this is better, essentially a better version of the statement that I made before. Before I told you that in every bin of size two, we know that there has to be some operator, but I didn't tell you how big its OP coefficient had to be. So here we make the bit the bin a bit bigger, we make it of size four, and and the, the upshot is that now we can place a bound on how big it has to be. Okay. So again, this is the precise sense in which all solutions to the bootstrap equation resemble generalized free fields. In particular, in a bin of size four, on average, the OP density has to look exactly like the one of generalized free fields. Uh, Miguel, can you go to the yes. previous slide? Uh, just to understand correctly. So if the sine pi square factor is zero, does that mean like for the special operators, I can have arbitrary large OP coefficient? No, it would just mean that that bound is not, uh, I mean, this bound is, is tuned to give you interesting bounds for the OP density in, uh, in the vicinity of delta n. Uh, but you were saying that the this size what of you BN want can you be... Want the bounds which are here. Yeah, but you were saying that the, I mean, the, the size, size of, of BN, BN can be, can be large. In, 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 it can be large, and I, I mean, you can choose n, right? I'm not sure I follow your question because I mean, this. Uh, so for any n, as long as n is large, basically this bound will hold. So you could, I yeah. mean, if you wanted to bound OP coefficients here, right? Then you know this bound would not be useful because there's a sine squared. So you would use, you know, instead of using alpha tilde n, you would use alpha tilde n plus one. I see. Okay. Right. N is a parameter. You can choose it to be whatever you want. Okay, okay, thanks. So for any n, there is some bound, and for large n, the bound would look like this. Uh, okay, so maybe let's do a quick a summary and then let's take a five minutes break. Uh, so I've shown you that there are what I would call functional bases. There are two bases, a bosonic one and the fermionic one. I call them bases because the sum rules associated with these functionals they are completely equivalent to the crossing equation. So in this, they are bases because they are complete in some sense, right? They completely capture the constraints of crossing equation. Using these bases, they translate into some rules. And these some rules, you see quite straightforwardly, you just need to plot, do some plots. They translate into constraints on the, the spectrum and the OP of CFT. And these constraints can be optimal. So they are very strong. Not only they are easy to derive, but they are super strong, they're optimal in many cases. And we've shown that on average, what these functionals tell, tell us is that all solutions to crossing are similar to generalized free fields. Um, okay. So, um, more questions? Yeah, Miguel, quick question about this kernel key that you showed in your uh, lower bound. Uh, yes. Yeah, here. So yes. this, um, this you know explicitly, is it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's trivial. I mean, it was just too big to write down. I mean, so it's the it's the thing that describes this shape. So it's mm -hmm. what? It's sine squared. Then there's this factor, delta minus delta n squared, which is a double pole. And then there are two simple poles at this point and this point. So it's something like delta minus delta n plus 1 and delta minus delta n minus 1. That's it. I see. It's, it's, and it's all of them are sitting in the denominator. It's all, Sorry? All, all, the, all these factors that you just not uh, said are sitting in the, in the denominator. In the denominator. Yeah. Okay. In the denominator, yes. And there's a sign yeah. squared in the numerator. Yeah, so this is finite. Difference. It's a finite function. I see. I see. Again, okay. it's a function that describes this, this shape here. It's just sign squared times some poles. I see. More questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, uh, could you uh, elaborate uh, on the fact that uh, how you constructed this uh, functional UN? Um, like, uh, 
so how like could we have any other uh, choice of construction that would have sufficed our condition like you uh, you chose this beta n plus 1 and beta n minus 1 if uh, if i wanted to find uh, this um, this bin around delta 0 then i'll have to i guess put uh, n equal to 0 then um, how would i interpret this or could i use some other kind of No, it's exactly what you said. I mean, so this is like engineering of functional. So you have to choose the, so I, 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 there's some co coefficients that sit behind here. So this is schematic. And, uh, you know, you're trying to find the lower bound. So you have to search in the set of functionals that you have, what can you do that will give you a nice bound, depending on what you want to bound. So here we were looking for a lower bound. So basically we guessed something like this. And when you plot it, it, it looks like this. So you have to tune these coefficients this is why we had to define this alpha tilde is because we want things to be positive everywhere. And then you need to tune these coefficients to guarantee positivity as well. And that's it. I mean, th these, these bounds are not optimal. They are, they are optimal under certain circumstances. But what we can say for sure is that they, they tell you that parametrically, parametrically, the OP density has to behave like that of the generalized free field. So this is what matters. So you, you cannot have large you cannot have large corrections. You can only have order one corrections to the OP density. So yeah, okay. I I hope that answers your question. We'll see examples later on where we want to compute the bounds and we'll get much stronger bounds. I mean, I mean in general, the optimal functional will require summing up an infinite number of these guys. The question is how how does this expansion converge? as you had more and more of them. Yes, I was just wondering, like, uh, yeah, how, how could I get an intuition to construct uh, yeah, such optimal functions? Well, in yeah, general? I'll, show, well, it, well, I will, I'll show you a, in a concrete optimization problem uh, how you can find a good functional that converges rapidly to the optimal one. And then you, you can adapt this logic to any bound that you want to find. OK? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hopefully, I hope I hope we'll have the time. Okay, so maybe we can meet in five minutes. Yep, sounds good.
Uh, hi, sorry, I had one question too. Uh, can I ask it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this bound holds at, uh, in the end, to infinity limit, uh, right? But you also made statements about you can check it in the icing, uh, and it seemed like you were also talking about uh, checking what the bound is for some specific finite n. Uh, do you do I understand correctly that this holds only for that this exact bound only holds in the end to infinity limit, and do yeah, you have so, an idea? So, so with the, these bounds, with with these simple kernels, uh, they hold only in this limit. So uh, if for for finite n, you could have some correction. You could be one plus something that's decaying uh, as a power of n. Um, so the the exact statement, the exact rigorous statement is this one. So this is just, uh, it's just true. I mean, the reason why you need this large n limit, well, first of all, you want the kernel, you want the function, because the functional actions simplify and become this up to some power loss suppressed corrections. The other reason is because there are, the, there can be these negative contributions here. So these contributions increase the size of the bounds. Okay. But these contributions, they, they become subleading in this limit. So if actually, if you knew that your CFT has a, a gap above this delta star, then actually this, this would be, uh, you could get a stronger, uh, a stronger statement. But so for, for easy, for doing easing, you could, you can just compute the OP coefficients. You can compute this OP density exactly analytically, and then you can just check this limit. Uh, and it, 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 it's, it gives you some number which is below one. Okay, th thank you. Okay, should we resume? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, so we have these we have these functions. We've derived these these bounds. So now uh, let us try to understand what else uh, what else we can about the general space of solutions. Um, so, so the so the space of solutions to the crossing equation. Um, is, uh, is convex, so, so this is easy to see. So suppose that you have some, some set of OPE coefficients for which this is true, okay? Or you have various solutions labeled by some index i, where i goes from one to some n, then it's easy to see that if you just take the sum of these OPE coefficients, uh, then you will also get a solution, right? So you just, you, you just use this OPE density here, you swap the sums and you see that this equation will still be satisfied. So there are some constraints. The constraints is that the sum of these coefficients should have to add up to one, basically because the OP coefficient of the identity has to be one. And also we want these coefficients to be positive uh, because we want unitarity to be preserved. So you want that this sum is still positive. So what this means is that if you think of the space of CFT data and you have a bunch of solutions, the crossing equation, then the full set of solutions is the convex hull of those solutions. So I don't know if you're familiar with this. So if you have if you have a bunch of vectors and you take positive linear combinations of them, um, where restricted to this with this constraint that they should have add up what to one, this defines the convex hull. And so the full space of solutions is the convex hull of all these individual solutions that you find. So for instance, the convex hull of these four points gives you this square, 
of these three points to give you this triangle. So I didn't include all possible convex hull. So the convex hull of these two points is a line. If you take the convex hull of all the points, then you get a, a you get a convex space. Okay, it's necessarily convex, which includes all of these things. And so the nice thing about these convex spaces is that any solution inside the convex hull here can be expressed as a sum of the solutions which live at the, these corners here on the boundary. Okay, and so this this tells you then that to understand the full space of solutions, uh, we should focus on trying to understand the solutions which live at the boundaries of the solution space. Okay, because once we figure out those, then we can figure out all the other ones. At the same time, the solutions which, which live at these edges, um, since they are the ed at the edge, they should be very simple, right? Because so we are in the space of CFT data, right? We are going to places where the CFT data is extremized in some way. And so what happens is that we expect that many of the OP coefficients, for instance, will be zero at these boundaries. This is what prevents you from going further outwards in the space of solutions because a general solution will have many OP coefficients switched on. And then as you go towards outside in the solution space, some of these OP coefficients will go down to zero. And then at some point, you cannot bring any of them further down to zero because you would, it would contradict unitarity. Um, so, okay, so we should aim for looking at these very special solutions. Those sol solutions, we should be able to bootstrap them with our functionals. So a general solution, it will have too many degrees of freedom. So the functionals, they will constrain them, but it will, it will not fix them uniquely. Here we are looking for those solutions which can be fixed uniquely just from our functionals, okay? So the number of degrees of freedom will basically have to match the number of functionals. And so we can look for these in two ways. We can either take known optimal solutions and deform them. So we can do this in perturbation theory, and it has the advantage that it would be an exact uh, approach. Or we can look for these solutions as optimal solutions to bounds. Okay, because I told you that these special solutions, they should live at the edges of solution space, so they should uh, saturate some bounds. And so we can look for these optimal bounds um, and the solutions which saturate them. So this we can do non-perturbatively, but we have to do it uh, numerically. So uh, let me first describe the an exact analytic approach. Uh, so let me just say there should be an overlap between these two things, obviously, because the same solution could be described in, in, in both ways. Okay, so as an example, let me describe a certain extremal flow. So we're, we're going to use functions that bootstrap deformations to the generalized free boson. Okay, so we're going to write down our solution in this form. So this is the identity, and here are the conformal blocks. We'll demand that the OP coefficients, so they have an expansion of this form where G is the coupling. Scaling dimension is the same. They have some expansion in, in some coupling. Um, and uh, we're going to say that at the beginning of the flow, so when the coupling is zero, we're going to say that this is simply the generalized free boson correlator. So the OP density is, is the, the the generalized free boson OP density, and the dimensions are the free boson dimensions. So if you take these things and you expand the conformal block, you see that it also has some expansion in terms of G. So everything appearing in this equation has an expansion in terms of G. And so our job now is to try to reconstruct what this data should be. Okay, so let us look at order G. So we have this correlator. Let us expand it to order G and impose crossing. So if we impose crossing, then we get an equation that looks like this. Okay, so here we get this uh, first correction to the OP density, and here we get the first correction to the to the dimension times the lowest order OP density. So it comes just from expanding this equation and uh, looking at crossing. So any deformation with that spectrum has to satisfy this equation. So now we can act with the let us just simply act with the, our functionals on this equation. And when you act, for instance, when you act with the alphas, you get this constraint, okay? And when you act um, with the betas, you get this constraint, okay? So this follows immediately just by using the duality conditions. We know that the functionals have to satisfy these conditions. 
So we just act on this equation and you need to get this. And you see that the data is fixed. So here's the first correction to the OP density is fixed in terms of this CN coefficient, which appeared here. And it's fixed in terms of this guy, delta zero one. And then the anomalous dimensions for general N are also fixed in terms of this delta zero one. So the only thing that we don't know here is this delta zero one. So why? Because delta zero one, it's basically, it's a free parameter in this case, and it amounts to the freedom that we have in defining the coupling. So I told you that there was some coupling G, but of course CFTs, they don't have any, they don't have any parameters, they don't have any couplings. So physically, we can just choose to define our coupling as, we'll say that the dimension of the first operator is equal to the free dimension plus G. So this means that by, def by definition of the coupling, this delta zero one, we take it to be one and all the delta zero ones will take to be zero, okay? So you see to first order, we have managed to, to, to fix our extremal solution. And now we can go to, 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 the, to the next order. So now the equation looks a bit more complicated, but basically it's just, you just take the, the equation I wrote down and you just Taylor expand to second order. Okay, so there's a bunch of coefficients, but so you see that you get again, the basis elements f delta n, the derivative of f delta n, and then there's a new contribution, which is the second derivative. So again, acting with the functionals, you get equations which fix the CFT data at this order in terms of things that you already know. So for instance, the, the second order correction to the OP coefficients is given in terms of the CNs, which you knew, the first order correction, which you computed in the previous slides. And then, so you see everything that appears here either has a zero or a one. It's either order zero or order one. And the same thing here. So the second order result is completely fixed in terms of the previous orders. Uh, so, so now you, you can basically just keep going. So this is order G squared. You can go to order G cubed, G fourth, whatever. And it's always the same logic. Whenever you act with the functionals, it fixes the new order in terms of the previous orders. So what we are doing here is that we are perturbatively constructing a new extremal solution. So in the beginning, the spectrum are these blue lines where the spectrum is equal to the, the generalized free boson. So delta is equal to two delta five plus zero plus two plus four. And now we are constructing these red lines as a perturbative expansion in this parameter G, which is supposed to be small. Okay, so this is fixed. So this is our definition of G and then all the other scaling dimensions will get fixed. Uh, curiously, this analysis precisely repu reproduces uh, an ads -CFT computation. Um, so in other words, when we, when we act with these functions, we are getting some CFT data, and this CFT data can be reproduced by considering Witten diagrams in ADS, uh, in ADS2. So the leading order computation that we did reproduces a contact term in ADS, and then the, the second order reproduces some one loop uh, things. And indeed, you can even go to two loops, and you still get an agreement. So why do we get an agreement? We are getting an agreement because basically to this order, the only deformation of the generalized free boson that exists is the one that's computed by the, these ADS diagrams. So of course the functionals have to reproduce that because there's, no, there's nothing else. So the functionals uniquely fix the solution. And since we know that at least this solution exists, it has to reproduce it, okay? Now, something interesting happens that, uh, so, so before I, I finish, so let me just say that then this is a different way of doing perturbation theory that does not require a Lagrangian or computing uh, diagrams. It's just a purely algebraic way of doing perturbation theory, which immediately computes for you all the CFT data. An important point is that at three loops, actually, it stops agreeing, okay? At three loops, if you compute the, if you do this at three loops and you compare with what you get from the functionals, they, they don't match. And this is fine. There is no contradiction. Uh, the reason is because the, the solution to crossing that you get out of ADSFT is, I would say that it's not extremal. Okay. It does not live on the boundary of solution space because in particular, the thing that comes out of ADSFT will contain multi-trace operators in the OP. Okay, 
Whereas the functional basis by construction will always just include one operator per bin. Okay, so these generalized free boson operators, which are getting deformed continuously. So it will never have these extra operators. So there is no, there is no contradiction. But now, how do you make sense of this? Uh, so the reason why you get a different result, basically, why it's possible to get a different result, is that notice that here, in what we are doing, we are only imposing the constraints of crossing symmetry on a single correlation function. And so nothing tells us that what comes out of this approach is a proper CFT correlator. I mean, it could be a correlator which is not embeddable in a fully consistent CFT. Does that make sense? So we are constructing solutions to the crossing equation of one correlator. The solutions that you come out of that might not be physical CFT correlators because physical CFT correlators, they live in a fully fledged CFT, which has many other operators and many other correlation functions all of which have to be consistent, okay? So this is the reason for this disagreement. It also shows you that there are limitations to our approach. Um, so I told you that we are, we, since we are constructing a new extremal solution, we expect that there should be some new basis decomposition, some new basis of functionals and a new basis of vectors. Uh, which give you a basis decomposition, okay? So here, now in this equation, we have in mind that the functionals here and the scaling dimensions now should be interacting. So there should be something that looks like this. Indeed, we, we are constructing it. Sorry, uh, delayed question. So um, the fact that you get a mismatch at three loops because of these higher trace operators, if yes. I drew, uh, say, Feynman diagrams at two loop order in ADS, and then I looked at these Kutkowski rules. I mean, I cut through the diagrams. Then can I show that only double trace operators uh, yep. contribute? Yeah. You can show that. Yeah. I see. And uh, multi trace this operators. Only appear from it's an order. Yep. Okay. In this theory, it's only a three loop. Okay. I mean, let me just emphasize of course, the solution that comes out of ADS CFT will satisfy the fun our functional sum rules. Of course, yes. because it's a solution yes. to crossing. Yeah. It's just that it's not an extremal solution. Yeah, no, that, 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 so that we cannot right. bootstrap. So what it's telling you is that at, at three loop orders, there is a family of solutions that can be bootstrapped. So there are many possible solutions. And this is giving you one of them, the solution which has the fewest operators. Okay. So there should be a new basis decomposition with interacting scaling dimensions and interacting functionals. So we should be able to construct these functionals. And indeed we can. So let me just show you how we can get these interacting functionals. So we expand the functionals in, uh, again, in order G. And so this correction to the, to the functional, we, we just re-expand it in the, in the, in the, in the leading order functions. So because these are the guys that we know. Okay. So this is our claim. We expand it like this. And now how do we figure out these coefficients? Well, it's simple. The conditions that these functions satisfy is that they should be dual. They should be dual to the new basis. So where the scaling dimensions, now they have corrections. So everything here has to be expanded in order G. And so if you demand that these duality conditions hold for the new basis, this completely fixes these coefficients. Okay, so we fix these ones and we fix these ones. So this new so this new functional basis also leads to bounds, and these bounds are of course saturated by this solution that we've been constructing. So we have a family labeled by the coupling, a family of bases to the crossing equation. These bases they have an associated dual basis of functionals. The basis describes a family of extremal solutions. This family solu of solutions satisfies a family of bounds which are implied by the functionals, okay? So it's all, it's all linked. And we can actually, we can see this uh, numerically. Um, so let us consider then the OPE maximization problem. The OPE maximization problem can be formulated as this. So we ask, what is the maximal allowed value of A at some scaling dimension, which I call delta zero, such that the crossing equation is satisfied. And we're going to impose that the spectrum begins at delta zero. 
So we set the gap and we ask what is the maximal allowed value of the OPE coefficient at the gap, consistent with crossing. Okay, this is a way of probing the boundaries of solution space. So this problem is actually equivalent to the to a similar one, which is let us minimize over functionals the value of the functional at the identity, where these functionals they should satisfy the following properties. So at delta zero, they should be one. And for scaling dimensions above the gap, it should be non-negative. So why is this why are these two problem equi equ problems equivalent? Well, it's easy to see. So, so you have a solution to crossing. So let us let us construct the functional that satisfies these, these constraints and let us apply it to the crossing equation. When you apply it to the crossing equation, you see that it gives you omega zero plus a delta zero plus these guys. Okay, but these guys are positive, and so automatically you get a bound that a delta zero is smaller or equal than minus omega zero. Okay, so if you minimize omega zero, you're going to get the best possible bound on this OP coefficient. Okay, so what we're going to do is that in this search for a functional, uh, we're going to search for this functional inside some finite set S. So any functional satisfying these constraints gives a bound. So we're just going to look for a functional satisfying this in some set. We have to make the set finite dimensional for numerical applications. But the hope is that if you make the set very large, eventually you get the optimal bound. OK, so what is this set? There are many choices for this set. So let me show you, what, show you one particular set. So you can choose this functional in the basis of functions, which is basically the Taylor series expansion. Okay, these functions would be just derivatives with respect to z at some specific z. And so these functionals as a function of delta would be just some coefficients, which you can choose, times derivatives of the crossing vector at the half. Okay, so these are valid functionals. Uh, and so if, if the size of this set is finite, this is a linear program and you can solve it efficiently in America. So you can, you can look for the function which minimizes this subject to these constraints. So the reason why I'm quoting these derivatives here, it's because before these exact analytic functionals were constructed, uh, at the beginning of the, the modern conformal bootstrap program, this is what people did, I mean, they still do it actually. This is still the, the majority approach is that people, they solve these problems by looking at, by searching for functions with many, many, many derivatives. Okay, and then solving this problem numerically. But we're going to try to be a bit more clever. And instead of working with derivatives, we're going to use the functions that we've constructed. So now we're gonna take a finite set of the functionals that we've constructed. And you know, cook up an answer. So we're going to take a linear combination of these guys, and we're going to search for a functional omega satisfying these conditions and minimize its value on the identity. So we're going to tune these coefficients such that you minimize this. So this problem is still a linear program. We are just working with a different basis, so it can still be solved efficiently numerically. Now, I mean, why should we use the derivatives or should we use the derivatives? Should we use our functionals? I mean, clearly, I hope to have convinced you that we should use our basis because I've already showed you that in many circumstances, our, our basis gives optimal bounds. So even, so for instance, let us imagine that we set in this OP maximization problem, we set delta zero to be two delta five. We already know that the optimal bound is that in this case is saturated by the generalized free boson and the optimal functional is alpha zero B. And so in this case, even if our search space had a single element, we would automatically get the best bound, okay? Whereas with derivatives, we would need to, in principle, include an infinite number of them. The size of our search space would have to be infinite. So in practice, so if you do the numerics for this particular problem, what you find is that using this basis, the bound that you get does not change with n because it's automatically given by the first guy. And the bound with derivatives, it systematically improves as you increase n and you know, asymptotically it will converge to this one, which is the optimal one. So of course, this is for this very special case where delta zero is equal to two delta phi, but actually, so now we're gonna go away from this point and we can ask the same question. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you, 
that the, the same logic sh pro shows that in, in practice our basis converges extremely fast. So here I'm showing you a plot where so this is the the maximal value of this a zero, okay, as a function of the gap, what I call delta zero. And I'm varying the gap between two delta phi, where we know that this is the generalized free boson. And then we slowly increase it. We increase the gap and we see what's the maximal allowed value of A0. So what I'm not showing you this plot is basically that using this, this search space that I defined, with derivatives, this takes extremely long to converge to this curve. Whereas with functionals, basically, once you have n equals 3 or something, it's, it's, it already converges to this black term, okay? So it's, the convergence is extremely fast in this case. And so this tells you that CFTs here in this region are not allowed, and CFTs here are allowed, and this bound basically is optimal. Now, we can, we can compare this with our exact analysis, because you see that here, it's very similar to the exact problem that we were solving analytically. So there's delta zero, which we are varying, Right, um, and so we may hope that since when delta zero is two delta phi, the bound is saturated by the generalized free boson, which was our starting point in the analytic analysis. Then, if you deform it just a little bit, it should match our exact analysis, and indeed it does. So these dashed lines are the results that follow from doing the perturbation theory analysis that I described before. So this is at three level. The blue dashed line is at one loop and the red dashed line is two loops. And you see that indeed the numerical results match the exact ones uh, on the nose. Of course, the exact ones at some point they stop making sense because the coupling becomes too large. But so I think this is very encouraging. And you can do the same check on the anomalous dimensions. So they also match very well. So we have this complementarity between these two approaches here. We have the exact approach and we have the numericals and then sometimes you can get an agreement between the two. Miguel, this so we uh, can do this one question. So this this perturbative expansion in terms of G for the uh, for the extremal solution, so where you don't have these higher trace operators, yes. uh, is that series Borel summable? I mean, they, 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 can one ask the, uh, these questions? Um, Bor I don't say no. I think it's just it's it's a convergent series actually. Well, it's, a, it's a convergent series. I see. Yeah, I think it just converges. Uh, but yeah, I didn't look at this in a lot of detail, but I don't see why it should not be convergent. Uh, because there, there's no, I don't see any non-analyticities in the neighborhood of G equals zero. And right. you know, you can just cheat, okay. see them whether it's converging or not, and see it's converging. But, but the guy with the multi-trace yeah. operators should not be borderless right? I mean, is that is that correct? The, the guy with the multi-trace operators? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, those guys, they, they appear at a fixed order in G, so maybe they lead to some non-analyticity in the correlator. Uh, but okay, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Okay. I think this series is convergence, but even that, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. Okay. Uh, it's it basically, it's the statement, well, the lambda phi 4 theory in ADS2, I think, uh, it's a renormalizable theory. I think it amounts to that. Yeah. So I think it should it should converge. But okay, I'm not. Uh, I, I, no, I, but that does not guarantee uh, convergence in G, right? I mean. Uh, yeah, but G. Yeah. So in ADS two, it would be the coupling of lambda phi fourth. Hmm. So you just put in you put in the coupling to <clears> lambda phi fourth, and now you ask what this if if the perturbation theory in that G converges or not. Maybe it doesn't, you know, I don't know. And usually the reason for non borel summability is because of the growth in the number of Feynman diagrams that multiple loops. But here, it seems like it is not an expansion in Feynman diagrams, the extremal solution. So it might have better convergence properties. Right, yes, yeah, yeah. So the extremal, so yeah, exactly. So the extremal solution, I think it, it just converges. Mm -hmm. But this might not be the, the full correlator as you're saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you're probably right. Um, so, so here's an example. Ah, so now let it, so you see that there's a flow and uh, something special should happen at the gap here because we know that the maximal gap is two delta five plus one. So the solution that maximizes the gap and the solution which maximizes the OP coefficient have to be the same. 
And so indeed, when you look at the spectrum of this extremal solution, it's kind of neat. So the first operator is delta zero, so it's just varying linearly here. And then these are the other operators in the solution. And so when the gap is two delta phi, this spectrum is just a generalized free boson. So this is two, four, six, eight, ten, and so on. And then as you vary the gap, you see that this extremal solution will flow to a new one. And this new one is, is simply the generalized free fermion. So we have a smooth interpolation between the two bases that we've constructed, the generalized free boson bases and the generalized free fermion. And in between, there's just a, there's a family of interacting solutions with their own associated bases. Um, okay, so yeah, maybe. So this optimization procedure is also is computing for you these bases numerically uh, and approximately. So you can also check that this matches with what we've done before. So anyway, I, I think I'm running a bit short on time, so I want to skip that. So yeah, so basically, again, you have this solution of the, the this picture of the solution space. It's a convex space. When you optimize, you can go towards the boundary. Inside the space, there are non-extremal solutions. These non-extremal solutions, they can be written as combinations of, of solutions which are extremal. You can flow from one solution to the other along the edge by using, these, uh, by using the, the functionals. The functionals allow you to go from one to the other under smooth deformations. And uh, yeah, so the extremal functionals, they allow you to bound this space and they are dual to the points which sit at this boundary. And so here I showed you that it's possible to go from the generalized free fermion to the generalized free boson or vice versa. And in between, there's some interaction solutions. And of course, I mean, the boundaries of these space are a lot more complex. They have a lot more solutions. But... So this is some simple picture of what's going on. Hi, Miguel. Yes. So if I change a different functional basis, would I have a different shape of a uh, convex hull here? No, the convex hull is determined by the set of solutions. It's the, so the set of right. solutions uh, across the equation. Is that, it's just yeah, that at every, point, at every point on the boundary here, yeah. so they are, they are functionals. Solutions. They, they live on some tangent space. So the functionals basically, they live on the tangent space to an extremal solution. And that they tell you how to deform that solution to nearby points. So this is a different way of thinking about the functionals. They tell you how to deform yeah. solutions into each other. So they're really associated to the tangent space of the solution space at the given points on the boundary. Am I right saying that whether a solution is extreme or not depends on the functional basis we choose? Yeah, well, so now you, I, I'm not sure, I would translate your statements. How, I, I've been a bit fuzzy about what it means to have a, an extremal solution. So one possible definition is that it's a solution which has a basis of functionals associated to it, where the yeah. functions, they have to have these properties that the, the betas at the identity, they have to be zero. Um, it's not clear to me that that's the only solution or even the best one, but that's one possible definition. So you can think it's solutions which saturate bounds. Okay, I see. But yeah, I, I realize it's I'm a bit fuzzy on this because it's not clear to me exactly what what the precise definition should be yet. But okay, certainly solutions which saturate bounds should be included in that definition. Yeah, that's clear enough. Thanks. Um, again, I have another question. Uh, I, I cannot understand uh, intuitively why there exists a continuous family of theory between the generalized free fermion and generalized free boson. Intuitively, you cannot, you, you don't understand? Yeah, why, why there uh, exists a continuous family of theory between the, the, the free, free fermion theory and the free boson theory? What, what are the uh, fields in, in Mm. In, in the middle of the flow? I, 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 don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, here, again, here we have a family of solutions to crossing, which interpolate yes. between the general free boson and the general free fermion. Yeah. We don't know if this will persist. We don't know if this will persist, if there's any, if there's a, a full-fledged family of CFTs which interpolate between these two CFTs. Mm -hmm. 
We don't know if this exists. It could be that once you start adding more correlators, at some point, this flow will be broken. There will be some singularity which prevents you from going into the fermionic. Uh, okay. The okay. Fermionic solution. It, it could be that that's the case. The other case is that there is some theory that you can write down in ADS2, mm -hmm. which at low energies just looks like a free boson with, and then you couple it with lambda phi fourth, and then maybe you add other interactions. And this theory at strong coupling is equivalent to a free fermion. I like it, like easy model. Yes, so okay. some, something like this, or, or in sine Gordon, there's also some similar story, right? You can write down a bosonic Lagrangian, but that there are fermionic excitations. So okay. it could be that it's something like this, but, uh, but yeah. But uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so let's to, 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 to wrap up of lecture. Uh, let me introduce the, the definition of master functionals. So recall the Polyakov bootstrap. The Polyakov bootstrap was the statement that a crossing symmetric correlation function can be expanded in a, it has an expansion where instead of I working with conformal blocks, I work with Polyakov blocks. Where the Polyakov blocks, they have a conformal block expansion of this form. Okay, so the difference between this and the conformal block is given by this. Okay. So, you know, the form of this right hand side term suggests the finding, the finding new functionals, which I call master functionals. And I call them capital omega B, and they depend on a, on a parameter Z. So there's a, a B version and there's an F version. And they are defined in this way. So basically, I take what I have here, but now I'm going to use the functional. I'm not going to act with it on anything yet. So, so this defines for me a functional. It's a functional, which is a, an infinite linear combination of the, the functionals that we've constructed already. So the reason why I call this master functional is because you see that if you know this functional as a function of Z, then you could tailor expand to extract all the other functionals. So it's kind of like a generating function for all the functionals. OK? So it's kind of, you can think of it at this moment, it's just like some kind of a bookkeeping device to keep track of our basis. Um, but actually, it turns out that this is a bit more than a, a bookkeeping device. So this functional. So here I put a minus sign. I, th I think this is, these are the correct signs. So if these are functionals, then you know I can act with this functional on the crossing equation to get the sum rule. Okay, as usual. So Sorry, I take my I functional I act on the crossing. So, one second. Yeah, so the alpha and b is they are dependent on delta n or not? So these are the bosonic functional. So here they are not depending on delta. These are functionals. These are okay. here. I'm, I, these are functionals. I am not acting with the functionals on anything in these definitions. Okay, so alpha and these are just numbers. Some some numbers. No, no. These are functionals. These are these are functionals. Okay, so okay, okay, okay. These are the functionals that we had before. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm taking a specific infinite linear combination of them where the coefficients are these things. Yeah. Okay. So you're just summing them up with unit weight weight for some reason. Sorry, what? What? You're summing up all the functionals with unit weight. No, no. The weight is this. The weights are these things. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. So think of these as coefficients. This is just uh -huh. some combination of alpha nf and beta nf, but where the coefficients are these things. Okay. Okay, and they depend on z. So they depend on z. So there's a mm -hmm. family of these functionals labeled by z. You choose z, and this gives you a particular linear combination of alpha n's and beta n's. Mm -hmm. So since this is a functional, I can act with it on the crossing equation. There's a subtlety, which I'll mention later. So let us just assume that this is a functional. So, so it generates a sum rule. Now, what is the sum rule? What does this mean? Well, from my definition of omega, the functional action, so when this functional acts on a crossing vector, it gives g delta minus the Polyakov law, right? Because of this, d delta minus g delta is this. And this is the functional action on delta. 
So the functional action is equal to this. And so what is the sum rule? What does this sum rule mean? This sum rule is nothing but the polycock bootstrap. Okay? So validity of the sum rule associated to this functional is the same as validity of the polycock bootstrap, which is kind of neat. Okay? It's a different way of imposing polycock bootstrap, is imposing that this functional. The, it's imposing the sum rules for this functional. Now, there is an important subtlety here, which is that even though this is a perfectly good functional when acting on a single crossing vector, since I have this infinite sum over functionals, you might worry that whereas the alpha ends and the beta ends, they commute with sums over crossing vectors, this guy might not. So, I mean, it's not obvious that you can do this, that you can take this sum outside. Okay, but actually, we've already checked this because the statement that these two things commute is precisely the swapping statement that we discussed that the sum over n commutes with the sum over delta. So we've already proved this. And so this is actually a perfectly good functional that acts on the crossing equation and which is compatible. So it, you, you can swap it over infinite sums. So the conclusion then is that we found a new basis of functionals which is equivalent to the crossing equation. Okay, so we just proved that the sum uh, is, uh, okay, so and, and it should be equal to zero. Zero equals this, and this should also be equal to zero. So if this vanishes, this the crossing equation being valid is the same as this these sum rules vanishing. For this is for all z, and here is for all w. Okay, so it's a new it's a new way. But of course, we already knew this in a sense because I mean. I just showed you that this is the Polyakov bootstrap. It's the Polyakov bootstrap. And we had already seen that the Polyakov bootstrap is equivalent to the crossing equation. So this is, in a sense, a different way of writing it in terms of these functionals. Now, if these are, if it, if these are good, good functionals, and these are, so these are associated to an extremal solution, so could it be that they are actually, if they are, they are extremal functionals? Could it be that these functionals, they compute the bound? And indeed, they do. The functions they compute about. So let us look at the let us look at this functional, and let's think about the functional action on the generalized free fermion. So when it acts on the generalized free fermion, it's easy to see that it has to give the conformal block of the generalized free fermion, and the derivative gives the derivative. Okay. So this is only true at, at the dimensions of the free fermion. Okay. It just follows from this definition. So now let us plot the Polyakov block. Recall that the Polyakov block is determined in terms of these functional actions in this way. So P delta is omega minus G. So because of these conditions, you what do we expect? We expect that the Polyakov block, if you plot it, it will look like this as a function of delta. So I'm fixing the cross ratio Z to some value, and now I'm plotting the Polyakov block as a function of delta. Okay, and the Polyakov block, again, it's just, it's related to the functional action of this one. And you see, I mean, I haven't proven this, I will have to show it later, but it's consistent with these relations, with these duality conditions. It's consistent that the Polyakov block behaves like this. You see, so it has, when you subtract the conformal block, it will have double zeros at these points. So in particular, you see that the, this, the, the, the Polyakov block is positive for all delta. But then this is very nice because let us use the Polyakov bootstrap. The Polyakov bootstrap tells us that the correlator is equal to what? The Polyakov block for the identity plus all the other states. Polyakov blocks for all the other states. So this guy, we know it's there for sure. These guys, we don't know. But we do know that the OP coefficients have to be positive. And now we also know that these Polyakov blocks are also positive. And so we have just learned that the correlator has to be larger than the polyakov block for the identity. And it's easy to check that the polyakov block for the identity is nothing but the generalized free fermion correlator. So we just proved a bound 
on the correlator. So any CFT correlator has to be larger than the generalized free fermion correlator. Of course, this holds when Z is real. And so this is the bound that this functional is associated to. It's a bound on the value of the CFT correlator. Now you can repeat exactly the same logic for the boson, for the bosonic master functional. So the duality conditions now, they look almost the same. There's a, a relative sign that you need to include. However, there's an important difference because recall that the beta zero bosonic functional does not exist. It's zero. And so one of these duality conditions will not be present. The n equals zero one will not be true. And so when you plot the Polyakov block, it turns out, as a function of delta, it turns out that now it looks like this. So now it's positive, but only above the gap, uh, only above this 2 delta phi, the, the dimension of the first uh, GFF. Thing. So again, let us, let us do the Polyakov bootstrap. So we write the co uh, general correlator. Again, this is a general CFT correlator as the identity guy. Sorry, there's some typos here. Um, so this should be B, and this should also be a B. So if we use the Polyakov, the bosonic Polyakov bootstrap, the correlator can be expressed in terms of the identity Polyakov block plus all the other ones. And let us say, for instance, that this theory has a gap which is larger than delta zero B. So there should also be a B here. Okay, let us suppose this. Then, well, all these terms will be positive. It will be, uh, sorry, it will be negative. All these terms here will be negative because there's a minus sign here. And so we conclude that a general CFT correlator with this gap has to be smaller than the generalized free boson correlator. Okay? So the bound, this master functional is the extremal functional for a bound on the, on, the, on the value of the correlator, the maximal allowed value of a CFT correlator. So, I mean, you can think in terms of these functions, or you could just have thought in terms of the Polyakov bootstrap. Uh, but then you need to argue positivity of the Polyakov blocks, and this will it turns out it's, it's easy to show using these functionals. So we will do this in the next lecture. But so this is what we've proven. We've proven, um, we've proven the following statement. So for any CFT correlator, this is not restricted to one DCFT CFT correlator. So take a, ge a general correlation function, a general CFT uh, correlator in any space-time dimension, and you put it on the line. You put Z equals Z bar. Um, then the following statements are true, which is the correlator has to be larger than the generalized free fermion correlator, and it has to be smaller than the, the generalized free boson correlator, plus basically contributions from Polyakov blocks with small dimension. Okay, because these are these are the guys which are negative. Right? In this plot, it, it, it's the guys that live here. So our bound, we, we, we have to put all the guys that live here on the right-hand side. So this is the most general bound. And so if, if, you, if you assume a gap equal to 2 delta phi, all these terms drop out, and you only get what we showed before. And this is very nice, because again, so these correlators, they are just known correlators. So let us do a check of this. So here I'm plotting the ratio of CFT correlators divided by the generalized free fermion correlator. So this has to be a number which is larger than one. Okay. So the generalized free fermion correlator lives here. It's this line, the line equals one. The generalized free boson correlator lives here. And so if you have a CFT whose gap is larger than two delta pi, it has to live here in this region. So as an example, let us take the, the 3D easing correlator. I could have also plotted the 2D, but so here's the 3D easy correlator. Then, as you see, it indeed it satisfies these bounds. So it lives right in between the two. 
So notice that it satisfies our assumptions because delta phi easing is 0 0.518 and the gap for the easing is 1.413 and this is larger than 2 delta phi. So indeed, this bound has to be satisfied. And, uh, and indeed it is. Okay, so to summarize this part, so we've defined master functionals. The master functions act as generating functions for the basis of alpha and beta functions. Uh, they imply certain sum rules labeled by the cross ratio, which are nothing but the, a restatement of the polar complex trap. And they are extremal functionals. They lead to bounds on the allowed values of correlators at the point Z. And so there's one functional per point. And what we'll see in the next lecture is in particular, so that there's a, many other things that you can say about these functionals, but they allow us, so basically, since they are functionals, they should have a representation of this form of an integral over some f kernel and an integral over some g kernel. So we'll construct these kernels. And so this will allow us to compute the Polykov blocks in a new way and to study their positivity properties. And they will allow, also allow us to say other things about CFT correlators. Uh, so uh, that's it. That's it for today. Okay, let's thank Miguel for an excellent talk. Uh, it was very nice, at least from uh, me. Uh, ah, so, questions? Are there questions? Uh, I would have one. Is it possible somehow to make some extra assumptions and uh, use the functionals to count maybe the number of solutions? Uh, obviously, you cannot do it in generality because there are solutions with continuous spectra, but under some assumptions to count the number of, uh, uh, sorry, of operators in uh, between two, um, between uh, two, three, uh, free field um, uh, operators. To count the operators. So, so in, um, so here, I mean, so, so here, here you see that the spectrum just changes ad adiabatically. In this particular example, there's a flow between the boson and the fermion. You can yeah. think that the the knob that you have to experiment with is the is the this this guy. The first operator, and as you move it, the other guys shift themselves. They shift their positions to adjust for this operator. Um, mm -hmm. and, and but so you see that the number of basis elements is always the same here. So also that would be the same for for any other gap. You would say there would be only one. For any other gap. I mean, between 2n plus delta phi plus 1 and 2n plus delta phi plus 3 or something like this, how, how many operators? You, you showed yeah, that there is a... There's just one per, per bin of size 2. I see, I see, I see. So this is what I expect to be true of any extremal solution. Is that the extremal solution, they should have the minimal amount of operators possible. And the minimal amount, we know already that in a bin of size 2, there has to be at least one. This we've seen from the functionals. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, this. Uh, and, and so this would tell you that this should be the general case. Now, if you are asking about understanding the general say, space of solutions, um, yeah, I think there's a decent chance of a program of this form succeeding. So, you basically, you need to characterize all these extremal solutions. Those solutions, in principle, they can be bootstrappable. They should each of them be associated to some basis to the crossing equation. So you, it's the program of understanding basis in this space of crossing vectors. If you understand all possible allowed uh, basis satisfying certain properties, you will have classified all extremal solutions. And then from the extremal solutions, you can construct all the other ones by taking linear combinations. So I think mm -hmm. this would be the, pro the program of classifying. Uh, yeah, this is how I see it. Uh, right, right. And then these linear combinations, they would have more. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, the linear combinations, you could not boot, bootstrap them. They would, they would have degrees of freedom. But there are solutions. So the extremal solutions, they are the ones which are rigid. They are the ones which they can be fixed uniquely. The sum rules would fix them uniquely. 
and, and could you also say like for, for a minimal model or something uh, what happens i uh, for a minimal model so for, for some the minimal 2D, yeah. for 2d cfts yeah but for example the ones that are also for 1d uh, the diagonal one um but they are also for 1d so i'm not sure you're talking about holomorphic sectors or yeah 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 that, that works. uh i i haven't thought about that so some solutions so, so for instance the, the epsilon correlator into the easing if you restrict it to the line i mean both halves are just the generalized free fermion in that case so indeed it's an extremal solution and uh uh, maybe I'll mention it in the next lecture. I haven't fully decided the content, but so there are generalizations of this story to higher dimensions, and you can ask about extremal solutions in that context as well. And we know mm -hmm. in some cases, minimal models are extremal solutions. I see, I see. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I don't see any further questions. Uh, and it was a long lecture, uh, so we should give Miguel a break. And we reconvene again, same time next week for the final, uh, uh, the third lecture of uh, Miguel's uh, set of lectures. Thank you very much, Miguel. Okay. I'll stop Thanks, recording Paul. here. <laughs>